Hey, what's going on, you guys? It's Ace is High, and uh, today I'm bringing you guys a little bit, uh, little, I guess, I don't even know how to describe it. Basically, I'm, I'm working back on Rome again, so I'm doing my whole Rome series, but I'm, I'm torn. For the last few episodes, I've asked you guys, which one should I watch, Historia Civilis or Kings in General? Um, and you guys have responded a lot. I really, really appreciate it, seriously. Um, but what I've come to understand from all of your comments is as far as political things and like the rise of Caesar, things like that, I should probably watch Historia Civilis. Once Caesar dies, I should switch over to Kings in general and any major battles I should switch over to Kings in general. So that's what I decided to do. This, uh, this video is going to be by Historia Civilis. I do have a link down in the description and uh, it's going to be the next year. It's going to be 57 BCE. It's titled Nobody's Year Chaos. Um, so I thought it First off, I just thought it was cool. His year, and it doesn't say any name, which was kind of cool. But uh, anyway, I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, let's just get started. When the consuls for the year 57 BCE assumed office, Rome was in bad shape. Cicero had been banished from the city. Clodius and his supporters were on the streets, and political violence was on the rise. Two new wow. consuls were walking into this mess. The first was Lentulus, a well-respected politician on friendly terms with Caesar and Pompey, as well as Cicero. The second was Metellus Nepos. He was not well-respected. He was a populist who had got into a bit of a tussle with Cato in 62 BCE, which had ended with him being humiliated and fleeing Rome in disgrace. But he was one I wonder how he worked his way back into the Senate then, you know? One of Pompey's people, and Pompey's support was enough to secure for him the consulship. Okay, that's, Cicero's that's how. Cicero's younger brother, Quintus, went to Pompey at the beginning of the year to make a deal on his brother's behalf. He promised that if Pompey could get Cicero's banishment lifted, Cicero would agree not to criticize Pompey, Caesar, or Crassus openly. Remember that these three were in a secret alliance. Pompey agreed, but he had to run it by his allies first. So a messenger was sent to Caesar in Cisalpine Gaul. Initially, Caesar wasn't super supportive. He was still feeling sore towards Cicero for not supporting his agenda during his year as consul. Right. But getting this kind of concession from one of Rome's most influential politicians was too good to pass up. He agreed. Crassus had no special quarrel with Cicero, so he was cool with it too. With that, it was decided. Pompey pulled some strings, and at the Senate's first meeting, Lentulus put forward a proposal to lift Cicero's banishment. Cicero's personal popularity in the Senate remained high, so that wasn't the problem. The problem was that the Senate had been strong-armed by Clodius the year before, and had felt pressured to force Cicero into exile. But with Lentulus introducing the bill, and Metellus Nepos supporting it, and Pompey speaking passionately on its behalf, everybody felt comfortable getting on board. It passed with a huge majority. Hmm. As always, the legislation went to the public assembly to be rubber-stamped by the people. So Cicero's coming back, I guess, after all that. As long as, I guess, he accepts it, I'd assume he would. Kind of get his honor back, his job back type of thing, you know? Clodius was no longer in elected office, but he was still a senator and had voted against the bill. And more importantly, he still had his gangs of supporters out on the streets. On the day of the vote, Clodius showed up with his gang, which included a bunch of gladiators armed with swords. Let's not... I thought that... I guess if you're a gladiator, you can have a weapon when you're inside the Colosseum, but other than that, can't you not have weapons inside of Rome? That's a big no-no, isn't it? Gloss over this. Up to this point, political violence had been somewhat normalized in Rome. Pushing and shoving had become common. Open street fights between different factions were becoming more and more frequent. But make no mistake, Clodius was bringing this to a whole new level. All of our sources say that he brought gladiators, but don't forget that these were professional killers and Clodius was paying them. We have a word for that. Mercenaries. Armed with swords. Yeah, okay, yeah, armed with swords. That's the huge part. I mean, sure, the mercenary, that's one thing, but they are armed with actual weapons. Rome was supposed to be a demilitarized zone, and yeah. swords were forbidden in the city. I can't overstate how significant this was. This was looking more and more like an armed militia. Clodius's supporters moved against the public assembly, and there's no other way to say it. It was horrible. Dead bodies covered the streets, and people fled in terror. Several of the tribunes of the plebs were seriously wounded, which, let's not forget, was a death penalty offense. 
Cicero's wow. brother, Quintus, was there to see the lifting of his brother's banishment, and he survived the slaughter only by crawling under some bodies and pretending to be dead. Titus Annius Milo was a popular conservative tribune of the plebs, and for him, this was a life-altering experience. He decided on that day that the only way to put an end to this political violence was to fight fire with fire. Milo rallied his supporters and told them to take to the streets. He then enlisted his own cadre of gladiators, or mercenaries, whatever we're calling them, and illegally armed them with swords of their own. <laughs> From that moment on, whenever Clodius showed up and started to cause trouble on the streets, Milo responded by rallying his supporters and causing trouble in return. Violent clashes broke out all over the city, and the death toll skyrocketed. We have one description of the Tiber being filled with corpses, and the ground on the Forum being covered in blood. Could, uh, I, I can't think of his name right now, but the guy that brought the glad gladiators the first time, could uh, they not just exile him? He, d he can't have the gladiators around him at all times, right? Was he, w was he really that strong? That powerful? This wasn't just gangs getting into fistfights anymore. These were men armed to the teeth, showing up with the intent to kill. This was anarchy. Hmm. As the body count continued to rise, public opinion began to turn. The mob violence was horrifying, and normal citizens began to call for Cicero's return. There are two reasons for this. First, people were hopeful that the violence would stop if Cicero's banishment was taken off the table. Second, Cicero was most well known for being the guy who restored order during the Catiline Conspiracy. This rule of law kind of conservatism was now looking pretty good, and as a result, Cicero's personal popularity soared. Hmm, interesting. If Cicero was popular in Rome, he was a rock star in the rest of Italy. He had been born a provincial Italian, not a native Roman, and the Italians viewed him that's huge, right? Because then the rest of Italy would view him as one of them, basically. And uh, the people of Rome, it, I mean, he worked his way all the way up. But uh, they probably always kind of viewed him as not a native, you know? If, if I had to guess. Him as one of their own. It helped matters that he put in the work to maintain these relationships, especially with some of the richer landowners in the countryside. Pompey could sense that Rome was approaching a tipping point, so he went on a tour of Italy giving speeches and whipping up support. People from all over the countryside began to flood into Rome to voice their support for overturning Cicero's banishment. With Cicero's popularity higher than ever, the consul Lentulus launched a trial balloon. He introduced some legislation that didn't actually do anything except formally thank everybody in Rome who was working to get Cicero's banishment lifted. This passed with plenty of support and got through the public assembly without any violence. That was a good sign, so for the second time, he introduced the legislation that would formally lift Cicero's banishment. And again, Clodius voted against the bill, but it didn't matter. It passed with plenty of support. When it went before the public assembly, many powerful senators joined together and spoke to the crowd in support of the bill. Hmm. Milo and his hired gladiators, armed with swords, were lined up protecting the stage. Clodius showed up with his supporters, but when he saw Milo's show of force, that scared him off. The bill was approved by the public assembly pretty much unanimously. Cicero was free to re-enter the city. When he finally did, he was greeted with cheering crowds. Cicero spoke before the Senate and singled out Pompey, thanking him for working tirelessly behind the scenes to get his banishment lifted. And with Cicero finally back in the Senate, it was back to business. The most pressing issue to attend to was the fact that Rome was currently in the middle of a food shortage. Clodius's grain program, which had been passed last year, had promised free food to the urban poor. That's right, but it expanded the, the percentage, right? And at the time, there were several senators, if I remember right, they were saying that we just, we can't give enough, uh, enough grain for that. And uh, we, can't, we can't grow enough. And uh, they kind of just brushed it away as, well, that's next week's problem type thing, you know? Supply simply couldn't keep up and Rome's granaries were dry. Yeah. Cicero suggested that the Senate appoint a special commissioner to take command of Rome's agricultural supply chain. This commissioner would have unilateral authority to go and fix the problem, with the power to override regional governors or generals. Cicero then suggested that Pompey be that man. Lentulus seized on this idea and formally put it before the Senate. 
With Cicero's support and the support of both consuls, it passed easily. We can kind of piece together the deal that was made here. Cicero's banishment gets lifted with the help of Pompey, and now Pompey gets a powerful assignment with the help of Cicero. Pompey left Rome to go and fix the grain situation, and Pompey being Pompey, he did it in no time at all and made it look easy. Cicero was emboldened by his renewed popularity and had some scores to settle. Shortly after Pompey left Rome, Cicero marched up to the Capitoline Hill with a small group of supporters, took the tablet that listed Clodius's accomplishments during his year as Tribune of the Plebs, and destroyed it. Wow. He then gave a speech, arguing that none of Clodius's actions as Tribune of the Plebs were valid, because his conversion from patrician to plebeian was illegal. Keep in mind that Pompey and Caesar had been the ones to oversee this conversion. Cicero had a legitimate feud with Clodius, but indirectly dragging Pompey and Caesar into it makes it seem like Cicero was beginning to go back on his promise not to criticize them openly. Cicero was making an extremely controversial claim, and at the next Senate meeting, Cato slapped him down by saying that it would be extremely irregular for them to overturn an entire year's worth of legislation. Cicero was clearly out for blood, which is why he had opened this full frontal assault on Clodius's entire legislative legacy. I get why Pompey brought uh, brought Cicero back in. Um, what I don't really understand, I mean, I do understand it, but it just, God, I'll, I guess my comment is, God, he's really causing a pain, you know? He's being a pain. Like, it just, I mean, I get it. That's how change is made. And uh, he wants revenge for certain things, and he wants things his way. But uh, Jesus Christ, man. But with that avenue closed to him, Cicero began to make it clear that he was particularly interested in overturning a specific piece of legislation, which he considered to be a highly symbolic, lingering personal attack against him. While Cicero had been banished, Clodius had had Cicero's home in the center of Rome demolished, and had erected a temple to liberty in its place. To Cicero, this was a daily reminder of his humiliation, and he felt that the only way to complete his political comeback was to rebuild his home. The problem was, you couldn't just tear down a temple. It was a religious issue, which took him before a body we're now familiar with, the College of Pontiffs. Remember, Caesar was the Pontifex Maximus, which meant that he was supposed to oversee the College of Pontiffs, but he was off in Cisalpine Gaul, which meant that the college kind of governed itself. Cicero made his arguments to them, and when he was done, the college discussed the case behind closed doors. Finally, they came to a decision and made their report to the Senate. The college decided that it didn't feel comfortable overturning all of Clodius' laws, since the Senate had actually affirmed all of his actions when they had voted in favor of his legislation. But taking into account the Senate's acknowledgement that they had acted foolishly when they banished Cicero, the college said that they would be comfortable with changing the designation of the temple, allowing it to be demolished if Cicero wished. On top of this ruling, the Senate voted to foot a portion of the bill to rebuild Cicero's home. Wow. This was a big symbolic victory for Cicero. Even That's kind of like, a, hey, we're sorry. Uh, let's see if we can help make it up to you type thing. That's awesome. Even though he would go on to complain that the Senate was deliberately snubbing him by refusing to pay 100% of the cost. You just can't please some people. I mean, he kind of has a point. He got screwed over because of things that uh, the Senate did, and uh, now he has to pay for part of it. I mean, he kind of has a point, you know. Clodius was pretty upset by the Senate's rebuke, even if it was symbolic. Once the construction crews started work on Cicero's home, Clodius and his gang attacked, chasing them away. This wasn't quite enough for them, so they also attacked Cicero's brother's home, which was nearby, and set it on fire. Not long after this, Cicero was walking down the street when- Dude, somebody needs to take out Clodius, man. He's just ridiculous. It's not the way that things are going, or that they're supposed to go. Clodius' gang attacked him. They were all throwing rocks, and he could see that some had swords. He darted into the home of one of his supporters, and a crowd gathered outside to fend off Clodius's gang. When it's no longer safe for senators to go about their daily business, you know the political violence is out of control. Yeah, it's ridiculous. The continuing threat of this violence had forced the elections to be postponed several times, but finally, late in the year, they were held, and Clodius was elected aedile 
proving once and for all that his support remained strong, even after a year of setbacks at the hands of Milo and Cicero. At this point, Clodius and Milo were at each other's throats, each at the head of their own militia. Political rhetoric had reached unprecedented heights, with the two men openly threatening to murder each other in public. And, sadly, it would only get worse. Jesus. Alright, well that's that, you guys. Um, I see why they said his, uh, nobody's year chaos. Because uh, it was just crazy. It just... Sure, Milo... I mean, you can't always fight fire with fire. I get that. But Clodius... Dude, Jesus Christ, man. He just kind of went crazy, you know? And uh, what do you do in a situation like that? Because it's not supposed to be a spot... Or it's supposed to be a place where there's not weapons and things like that. And you work it out uh, through the Senate and whatever you need to do. Um, it's just an interesting situation. Anyway, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, Till next time, this is Ace Asai, and uh, I'm out.